Hello, everyone. Hello. Nice to see your faces. So today's satsang um, fits in with this month that we said would be corresponding to Swamiji's life. And so we'll be celebrating it this month in, his, in different aspects in the way that he expressed things. Today is music. Um, we'll also have one uh, about his books. And what was the other one? His lectures. His lectures and video. So that, that we'll, we're splitting it into three for, for uh, this month. And so, you know, one of the things Swamiji said was, if you want to get to know me, uh, listen to my music. And it is very true. And part of what he meant by that was not, do you want to get to know me personally? It was, do you want to get to know my vibration? I had a similar issue with Swamiji that Swamiji had with Master. He said when he was with Master, he would feel a little confused because when you close your eyes and tune into Master, that was a vibration. And then you open your eyes and you see this man in a body, you know? And it's like, okay, what do I do here? <laughs> you know? And it was similar with Swamiji, I felt myself. I felt a deep reverence for him and I also felt his vibration uh, very deeply as well. And so um, I feel when he said, if you want to get to know me, listen to my music, he really meant his vibration. And you know, the, the way we attune on the spiritual path is vibrational really only. It's vibrational. And master is a vibration. All of the masters came through passing down vibration from vibration to vibration through master as the channel of their vibration, just as each of these masters have paths that also kind of came out of them as well. You know, Lahiri Mahashaya also has his path. It's, obviously Kriya Yoga, so it's going to be a very similar vibration, but as vibrations have hertz, you know, uh, the, uh, the A note is called 440 hertz, so perhaps uh, we might be 440 hertz, and perhaps uh, uh, Lahiri's line might be 440.1. I mean, you, you, we just don't know. There's a slight difference. And when you go to a place, you say, okay, this is Kriya Yoga, it should feel the same. And you go and you go, oh, it's a little different. Um, we'll be, those of you going to Rishikesh uh, in November, which we haven't advertised really officially yet, it's not set in stone yet, um, we'll be going to the Kriya Yoga Ashram there. Well, it's not Ananda Kriya Yoga. So when you go there, you'll say, okay, there's the masters. I feel a similar vibration. But when you know you're in your home vibration, you can fully relax. You can fully open up. So you might notice now, the longer you've been here, that when you go to other places, it feels nice. You can tune into nice vibrations. But there's not really a you know? And that's how it is when you know you've reached your home vibration. That's, you fully relax. And with that relaxation comes also full receptivity. You know, the ability to receive the guru as open-heartedly and as wonderfully as possible. So Swamiji, in his genius and eternal creativity. He had a lot of creativity, but he was not personally attached to any of it. So even with his music, you might think, well, he was a musician, and he would say, well, this is my music or something. No. He might have said, this is my music, but it was never my music. And I remember late late, uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, he says, I'm done. I'm done writing music. 
And then we had a few chants trickle out of there. But basically, I'm done. And it was like, OK. That's kind of sad, but you know, I guess over 400 pieces of music, you might feel done. <laughs> and so I thought I would start off by just saying a little bit about the early days and music with Swamiji. And okay, so then I have to just switch the cable here. What is that? That is it not Things working. aren't working? Oh, okay. We can have it placed in a different way when you work on it. No, it's ready. Just switch this. Oh. Okay, so it's not really part of this slideshow what I'm gonna say though. So I came just after 1990, and by that time, Swamiji had already written most of his chants, most of his music, um, and I'll be going through kind of like the different categories of music which he did. And so when I came in, he was in a phase of doing kind of more instrumental music, and I was a flute player. So it, it fit in perfectly with that timing. And just a little bit about my path with music. I began when I was a very young child playing piano and then got played flute. And, um, and then by the time I was in 10th standard, I began playing in symphonies. I had very good teachers, um, a Western symphony, you know, that has all those other kinds of instruments. <laughs> and um, I was excelling in that, but I also loved math and science. So these were kind of these parallel things that, that were happening for me. And so I became involved in kind of the professional world of musicians in that way. It wasn't fully professional, but it was with people who were very, very serious about music. And I was too. But as soon as you get into a field, like that, or a field of anything, you know, it's the same of anything. There's kind of an intensity about it. And um, for flute players in, in the professional field, for instance, if you're part of a symphony, there's probably about 20 violins, and there's two or three flutes. So highly, highly competitive. I spent most of my early years competing for what was called first chair in the orchestra, band, or symphony. And they, they had this little challenge system where, you know, you could tell the person, next week I'm going to challenge you, <laughs> and who's ahead of you, and they're like, okay. And so then, <laughs> then you, you, would, you would meet after uh, band class or symphony class, and the director would be there, and he would just say, okay, both of you played this. And it's something you probably didn't see before. And whoever played it better, you know, either kept their seat or shoot. And so this is how they, I think, cultivated excellence in the field. You know, that's one way you can do it through competitive spirit in that way. So I spent most of my time, you know, in that environment. And um, the, the positive aspect was I was blessed by having incredible conductors from the very beginning. So in everything that I did, um, as I got older, I just had excellent conductors. And they expected the highest of each musician. And if you weren't good, you were kicked out or you fell out somehow. So it was... It was that kind of a thing with music. Meanwhile, there was the engineering parallel going on as well. And finally, by the time I was in grad school, I had to choose between engineering and music because I was kind of struggling in engineering also having music. So I just decided I don't want to compete the rest of my life in music. It's just the joy was being squeezed out of it. And I was giving more and more difficult pieces to practice. And they were like strange modern music. You know, like, 
<laughs> and it's just like, you know, and I was up here in my head anyway. I, I don't know how much I was really playing for my, from my heart. I mean, I loved certain, mu certain composers and things like that. I could say that, but, you know, as a musician gets better, they, and not only that, one of my professors was a um, composer, and not a very good composer, but he was so excited about composing, and so he would have, you know, little groups of us playing his music, and it was just like, ugh, you know, having to play this music. So I kind of just thought, no, I want to do engineering, and I dropped flute. This was in my early 20s just said, never mind, or mid-twenties or so, just, and, and I don't know why I, I didn't even say to myself, well, I'll join a community orchestra when I, when I, I just dropped it. I was done with that world. And um, so I, I did engineering and um, I guess channeled creativity through that somehow, I don't know how. <laughs> but, I, but you do. So, um, so by the time I came to Ananda, at, you know, kind of in my mid-twenties or so, I um, uh, didn't even have the thought of music in my mind, but then suddenly there was this beautiful chanting going on. Suddenly there was this beautiful uh, singing groups going on. There were guitarists playing along, and, and I was, again, blessed that there was a community of musicians within and on to Palo Alto when I was there. And so, one of the guys who was in charge said, would you like to join us? You play flute? Would you like to play something? And so, uh, at the time, you could buy every single piece of music, and now it's, you know, online, or you can get it through us, or whatever. And so, I had this big, fat book of music, and we would just go through that book and just play as much as possible, and uh, the music was in one state, and I'll explain how it progressed a little bit later, but some of the things that now are orchestrated to have four or five instruments played were just one uh, melody, you know, just a melody, and uh, so I, flute plays melody, so I could play all these songs on flute with a guitar player playing with me, or we would have duets. Um, and then I became involved in the singing group. I, meanwhile, in music and flute and everything, I was always involved in, in singing as well. So <clears throat> suddenly I was in this group. It was not competitive at all. It was supportive. Everybody was happy for everybody else doing well, which is Ananda. And so we began just playing music and just feeling just bliss and joy playing music. Music, music, music. I just happened to get in with this group that just was living, breathing, eating music. So that's how I was when I was especially younger, not with the you know, da 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 type music. But, but in the young days when I was having more fun with music, then suddenly I encountered this beautiful, fun phase that has never ended. It has never ended. You would think that, okay, I've learned all that music, I'm done. No. It's like once you learn stuff, you go deeper in it. You know? So it, it's, you can get bored if you just learn it. And okay, I know that song, I know this song, I know that song, next, next, next. But to learn to go deeper in that, and that's where attunement comes. And so you learn the music, but then you go deep in the music. And we know this through chanting. Because when we start out chanting, it may be more outward, we're remembering the words, we're saying the words and everything, and then suddenly something shifts while you're chanting and your energy begins to reverse. It's all 
astrophysical, I should say, not not physics, but physical. So our astral bodies normally have, when we're uh, in the world, the energy is flowing out through the senses as we're walking out through our days. But those of us who practice Kriya, even Hamsa does, does this, music does this, you begin to uh, do some type of practice like that and suddenly the energy reverses and begins to be, be drawn into the astral spine. And that's how we begin to interiorize. That's how we are able to begin to go deeper, is that interiorization process. Even service is meant to interiorize our energy. Through outward service, then with the mind focused on God, suddenly we become channels of that service and the energy gets interiorized. It's not just, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. It's suddenly I'm doing it with the thought of God. I'm feeling bliss while I'm doing this. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. It just feels great (laughs) because I'm connected to God while I'm doing it. And then that is an interiorization. We can have that through any job we have as well. Interiorization. So music is a wonderful way to interiorize. You're doing something outward because maybe just sitting there in meditation is all day long is not possible so you have to do something so music is a great way to to serve it's a great way to uh, have a pastime you know Uh, maybe better than video games or maybe better than who knows what so putting the energy into a, a wholesome habit a wholesome new thing to do so you can study the music if you want so this, uh, by the time I came, like I said, Swamiji had done a lot. And what he had done in the early days, you know, he tells the story of when he was writing some of his early songs and they were written on pieces of napkins and he wasn't, he hadn't even established Ananda yet and he, yet he was kind of singing for people here and there some of these songs. This is post self-realization fellowship, post being kicked out of that place. <laughs> and so uh, he was trying to find his way, and but music was flowing through. Now when music flowed through him, it was usually in one wave packet. You know, there was, sometimes it was just words first, sometimes it was melody first, sometimes it was both. But it would kind of come all at once, and then he would have to write down what, what was coming through. So that was also when he was, he, he used that very much as an example of how we can be channels in any aspect of our life, that we all can receive wave packets of information. We can all just be sitting there and receive inspiration if the willpower is there and the intention and the devotion and love and connection is there. We can all do that. So he, he really emphasized from the very beginning that not only am I creating all of this stuff, but you can too. That's, that's really... And, and very often, I remember, he would talk about, I, I created this, and I wrote this book, and this or that. He would be talking. Some people would say, oh, he's so egotistical. He's talking about himself. And... You know, and it was because those people couldn't understand that he had no attachment. So when he was even saying, I wrote this or I wrote that, he wasn't even attached to the word I. I wasn't, it's just, it was Swami Kriyananda did that. You know, really, that's, that's what he meant. To, or God did that through that channel, through that body. So, so he used, because he was a musician, he was really into music a lot. Now, he also had, you know, the healing path. Healing was always also very important at Ananda. You know, all all sorts of different aspects were important. Education, very important. Um, Children, uh, 
lots of different things in order to create community. Now, we've been told, and he has even said himself, that he's been a king many times in the past. And what can a king create? A kingdom. But when you're a spiritual king, you're going to create spiritual community. But what, what is really amazing is when you ever, if you're ever able to visit an Ananda community, and someday we'll have a real one in India, it's just going to take India's time. It really uh, deals with all aspects of life. And it's not that you have to have um, it's not that you have to have all bases covered, but it just turned out that way. You know, it, it, it turned out people came with children, so there had to be education. And then it turned out, you know, and all of these were seeds from Yoganandaji. Yoganandaji emphasized education. Swamiji took the seeds of what Master taught about that and wrote Education for Life and then trained Nitai and a few of the others who started the whole Education for Life movement and created what are called Living Wisdom Schools. So, and now, these children who have graduated have been accepted to top schools. So we know it is a valid, um, you know, thing that, that Master passed down through Swamiji. So, um, so the whole children aspect, and I'll even show you in the music. I used to, for about four years, I think, I taught uh, choir and music to K through, well, pre-K through eight um, at one of the Living Wisdom Schools. When I was in Palo Alto, we had a Living Wisdom School there. So I was the music teacher in addition to a lot of other things, but one of my jobs was music teacher. and. So I adapted Swamiji's music, plus some of the other pop culture music, but mostly Swami's music, in that school. And Swami wrote some uh, music specifically for children, which we'll, we'll learn a little bit about as well. So before I came, the other thing that Swamiji did was something called um, Joy Tour, Joy Singer Tour? The Joy Tour. The Joy Tour. So he decided, you know, 1968-69, people were drawn to this property that he had bought and began to establish as a retreat center and a residence place. But this was in the 60s, and in the U.S., the 60s were kind of wild. He was not wild. And that many people who came, Jochishji, Devi Ji, Haridas, Jaya, they were not wild hippies. I don't know if you've seen movies where they show American hippies into drugs, things like that. Some of those were going too. And um, there began to be kind of a kind of a monastic feel there, and then kind of this hippie strangos there as well. And meanwhile, Swamiji was going out and, um, and working. He was driving four hours to San Francisco and coming back only periodically, but he was giving yoga class, Raja yoga class, level ones. He was teaching all those classes and bringing the money back to help establish Ananda. And the People who were kind of of the monastic vibration started creating little businesses, that type of thing. The hippies were going to the river and sunbathing and, you know, thinking they were meditating. <laughs> you know, if, by the way, when you go to Rishikesh, you'll see some of those people there. It's a little, it's got some of that energy. But, um, so, he thought at one point, let's gather our energies and travel to get the word out about Ananda. So he gathered 
some singers that had been singing his music that began to. And they're, they're the ones who kind of, with Swamiji's help, created some of the guitar parts. Um, he had already created the different voice parts. Those of you who aren't part of choir probably noticed, you know, that the men and the women are not always singing the same part together. And the, the, the goal is to sound very like a harmony, like, like a chord in music. And so Swamiji wrote in that style, mostly. So he created a bunch of songs called the Joy Songs. And some of them were older that he had done before, and then he added to those as well. So these songs then were a, a tour. And so they, someone was the promoter. And so they booked all these towns. So they toured the US for a while. I don't know how long. Do you? Several months. OK. So they toured around and stayed in different cities. And, and people would come. They would give the concert, and Swamiji would give a talk. Swamiji did this very purposefully because that music sent out a vibration. So his speaking sent out a vibration, and that music sent out a, a vibration, and it drew many people that ended up back at the village. That music sent out a vibration that resonated in people and attuned, those who felt attuned to that vibration came. So <clears throat> sure it sounds nice, sure it sounds beautiful, maybe that is all that attracted it people, but just like autobiography of a yogi has a vibration in it, Swamiji was doing the same with the vibration of music. So he had also written the oratorio, which is the life of Christ, which we did a bit at Christmas and at, it, at Easter as well. Um, he had, just before I came, well, maybe I guess it was five to ten years before I came, he had written the Festival of Light, you know, the festival that we do here. So by the time, things were quite established, but it was more like they were established again in seed form, because then he started um, uh, saying, okay, here's a melody, let's have a flute play this, and a violin play that, and a cello play that, and, and it would be like little orchestras playing things. Or um, <clears throat> uh, when I first met him, he was recording something called Life is a Quest for Joy. And he asked me, actually, to play the flute, and he decided not to use me on that. Um, it turned out to be more a cello piece. So the cello is kind of the big, uh, wooden instrument that has a long thing. There's kind of the small one of those is the violin, the medium one is the cello, and the tall big one is called the bass. So they're all kind of that general guitar shape, just depending on how you're doing it, <laughs> like this. So uh, he was then very quickly, well, I think I told this story before too, but I'll say it again. Just when that group so generously brought me in to the music, they could have been exclusive. You know, they could have been, no, we, we don't take everybody. Here I was just off the street. Do you want to do it? It immediately made me feel welcome, and it immediately included me in something. So I started playing, happily playing my flute, and then I got involved in the chanting and, and choir and all that kind of stuff. It, if you want to think about attunement to the vibration, it just helped people just go like that. Others would join the healing prayers. That would make them attuned also. So different things. Obviously, uh, meditation is going to do that anyway. But these were more uh, social. So you had to uh, interact with others and interact harmoniously. Because if you came into that group kind of 
strange, you might get a thump on the head because you weren't behaving, you know? Or if you came in uh, with pride or you came in with competition or jealousy or anything like that, you get knocked on the head because it's like that's not what we're about. So, <clears throat> uh, so Swamiji happened to be visiting Ananda Palo Alto and I had, when people drew me in, I wrote him a letter and said, I love your music. I just love it. Thank you so much. I didn't know people could write him. Someone just said, why don't you write him a letter? It's like, okay. You know, so I wrote a letter. And I didn't hear back from him. I didn't, and back then, it was old-fashioned letters. Some of you might not remember about stamps and things like that. <laughs> And so, uh, so I think it was after Easter, something like that, I was walking down a sidewalk, he was walking down a sidewalk, and I hadn't met him before, and I just said, Dear, you know, hello, and hello, and you know, thank you so much for your music, I so enjoy it. And that's when he said, are you Dormini? Although that wasn't my name at the time, but are you Dormini? And I said, yes. And he said, well, uh, I would love to hear your flute. And so that night, I went and I played flute for him on a piece. I was kind of like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and on the flute, your lips, you know, have to form a, for, for a certain shape. But the way a flute player can be nervous is their lip shape. <laughs> so that's what my, my <laughs> so I got to play music for him. I don't think it was very good. But anyway, so then he invited me to the recording studio the next day to, to play this um, other Life is a Quest for Joy music. And I'm going to play a little bit of that for you as well. So that got me to know Swamiji. Then Swamiji started having summer a uh, concert series. So I started doing those. And it, they would be months long. So I would end up going up every weekend. And he would work with us very intensely on that music. He would be there. And he would be there to correct when someone would play it. He would give suggestions, correcting it. This is what you should do here. He, he was writing more. He wrote something called um, I Omar. And I did actually play, that was like the one recording I played on besides some oratorio music. And so I, Omar, came from uh, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, that scripture, which many don't know it's a scripture, but it actually is. And so uh, he had a bunch of us play on that album. He would be right there as we were recording. He'd say, no, do it again, do it this way. And um, he really taught a group of us how to go deep in that music, what to do with the music. And uh, we were so crazy about the music, it was just, uh, aside from doing regular work, I think I was still an engineer when I first started out. Um, and so uh, it just became I was already a musical person before, and this just kind of became part of my, a strong part of my Ananda life. So the other thing, aside from drawing in more musicians into his work by the time I got there, and, and writing more music for musicians, um, then he, he also came up a, little, a few years after I began, two years maybe, or four, and <clears throat> wrote something called Life Mantra. I'm going to play some of these for you in just a, a, a few minutes. I wanted to give this begin, you know, the introduction, which is a long introduction. But <laughs> um, uh, so he really helped us all go deeper and deeper and deeper in the music. And when we get back from America, I'll be holding some singing workshops and things. You do not have to be musical to benefit from, from the music. You know, you don't have to be. And you can learn how to use your voice. Swamiji also emphasized 
that the voice is a very important instrument in dealing with others as well. Um, he pointed out how very often when people get on the spiritual path, they might have a more measly voice or they might have, you know, kind of a harsher voice, you know, something like that. But as you sing, as you, or as you learn to speak from your heart, then things kind of, something smooths out a little bit. You, you can hear when people have a spiritualized voice, it's very distinct. Swamiji's voice was very much that way. And so um, our voices can, can change through not only singing the music, but also just emphasizing, drawing energy through the heart, up through the throat chakra, and out when we speak. And we can transform our voice in that way. Now, if you're in a workplace that doesn't value that, then <laughs> that they may not notice, but you yourself will notice, and you will begin to express more harmony through your speaking voice. Swamiji wrote a whole, not wrote, but has a whole video on the voice, and it might be on YouTube, um, and he talks about how to use the voice and everything. So I wanted to, oh, I need this chair. For the computer, yes. I'll take that chair and you can sit on a blue chair. How about that? Okay. I, I need a chair. I need the blue chair. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. So now I'll, I'll have control of both. So, <clears throat> I just want to give a... Okay. So, by the time I came, all of this was composed. And notice the theme here. Songs of Shakespeare, Mediterranean Magic, that's in Europe, Songs of St. Francis, Romanian Memories, Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, and Evening in Italy, Songs of India. Do we have a world theme here? <laughs> I think this is the, the mind of a king who wants to... In, the, in this world, I can't say he conquered the world or anything like that, but definitely there, there's something going on there with, with this kind of a thing. Um, I'm going to skip over the words, but we'll be listening. Then this one, he did the Joy Tour. These were just some of the names of the album, Songs of Divine Joy, Memories. A lot of what the choir sings these days are called the Joy Songs, Songs of Divine Joy. Philosophy and song is you know, there's the oratorio. All the worlds. That my friend was an album that came out that had uh, emphasized children's music. Life mantra. I want to play that before today. Um, then also instrumental. So I Omar was beginning when I came. He had already actually done Egyptian Suite. Life is a quest for joy was starting. The mystic harp was an interesting phase. Derek Bell was a famous um, harpist, uh, part of some pop Celtic band called um, the why I can't, the Chieftains, and he he left his body a lot long time ago. But so Derek was at Ananda all the time, and we got to hang out with Derek. He was kind of an oddball, but, but anyway, so. Swamiji wrote all this Celtic music. So this is from Ireland. And so that was flowing through him when Derek came around. And so then Derek did two uh, albums of that. So you'll notice Ananda has Mystic Harp and Mystic Harp II. Um, then Secrets of Life is another interesting album where it, it alternates uh, his affirmations with beautiful music. And then, then he began all of these ensemble, they're called ensemble albums. So, uh, and not only that, a professional cellist came in and a much more professional than me flautist flute player came in at that same time. And they began collaborating with violin and guitar and that kind of stuff, creating quite a few um, albums. 
And uh, now Bhagavati, who is the flute player, she and her husband, Ramesha, who's a, a violin player, they're kind of in charge of the music at Ananda Village now. And they come up with albums all the time. And it's always Swami's music, but or arranged in a different way. Then we've got the chanting. So early on, Swamiji, again, was recording the chanting. Then, um, oh, Mantra of Eternity, obviously that's <coughs> Mahamritan Jaya and Gayatri. Um, then Swamiji came out a little bit later, Kriyananda chants Yogananda, which was a very important one. If, if you've heard that album, it's very, very deep. This is when Swamiji was really entering his bliss phase, where uh, he was just going into bliss all the time. And um, there was kind of a phase. He did write a few songs when he got into that. One of the last songs wasn't Love is a Magician, one of his last songs. Yeah. So one of his last songs, which might have been this, the beginning of the bliss phase, really, or the outward bliss where we could see it more was this song Love is a Magician so I'll play that one as well but this is just some of the albums when I, not, not the songs themselves but the albums and then finally he also covered ceremonies so the Festival of Light that was there before I came all of these things were here before I got there um, Ananda wedding. We were married with an Ananda wedding ceremony. Um, <clears throat> and that ceremony has vows as well as music. Ananda funeral and astral ascension. So when, when I worked at our Sangha, uh, you know, we had a temple. And so people had their funerals and astral ascensions there. We would, the body would come and, um, and we would have the ceremony there. Um, and of course house blessings and things like that uh, so Swami established going to houses and blessing houses and of course we do our prayer at the meal so we're running out of time so I'm not going to do a whole lot of music but <clears throat> I would like to do three things one is children's music we're going to start with that because <clears throat> So the music that Swami did for children was really fabulous. And did we ever do Move All You Mountains here? Anybody remember doing that? Okay, so I want to, is it on? Does it come in the movie? I think it does. Let's dance. see, do they? Yeah. Let's see if this is a good one. <laughs> Okay. We may as well do that one. Okay, so everyone stand up. <laughs> okay, so, yes. Oh, wait, where's all the little volume mountains? Here it is. Okay, so, let's say the words. Move all you mountains that stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. And then that gets repeated. Then tall trees fall aside. Every bramble I slash with the sword of freedom. A bramble is like a bush in your way. So I don't know why that word's in there. Okay, so um, let's listen to her sing this. great this is for kids. So this one, let's, why don't you just sing after me? I'll, I'll sing it first. 
Move all you mountains that stand in my way. Move all you mountains that stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. Nothing can stop my progress. Move all you mountains that stand in my way. Move all you mountains that stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. Nothing can stop my progress. Tall trees fall aside, every bramble line. Tall trees fall aside, every bramble line. Slash with the sword of freedom. Slash with the sword of freedom. Tall trees fall aside, every bramble line. Slash with the sword of freedom. Tall trees fall aside. Okay, great. Now, the body movements. So we go, move all you mountains and stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. Move all you mountains and stand in my way. Nothing can stop my progress. So we stop marching. Tall trees fall aside. Tall trees fall aside, every bramble light slash with the sword of freedom. Okay, let's do it with her. (laughs) See what a great song that is? I mean, can you imagine if you were a kid and you got to sing these songs when you were a kid? (laughs) Yeah, becoming kids. It's like, they're so healthy. Okay. do All the World is My Friend, too. We may as well do that one. Okay. Ideal slide shift. Sh- okay, so it goes. Why don't you repeat after me? All the world is my friend when I learn how to share my love. All the world is my friend when I learn how to share my love. When I stretch out my hand and smile. When I stretch out my hand and smile. When I live from above. Okay, then it goes. All the world is my friend. When I learn how to share my love. When I stretch out my hand and smile. 
with her, okay? to going inward. <laughs> so, um, to zoom out. Do you want to switch it to there we go, PowerPoint? Is it in PowerPoint? That's for your side. That's choice. different. Where is all lyrics? Okay. Okay, there we go. So, you could do this one. Uh, I'm going to do The next one, so you can take your seats. Love is a magician. This really switches gears quickly. You've heard divine love songs through choir, so I won't go over that. But Love is a Magician is one of the last songs that Swamiji wrote. And in fact, he had a very difficult time singing through the lyrics because it meant something so deeply personal to him. And he was very choosy about who he let sing the song at, say, a public affair. He wanted someone who had deep feeling to sing this song. And so I'll play it, and here's the words here. Um, we won't sing along with it. We'll just listen to it. Imagine you did not 
possibly his last song, because he's writing after a lifetime of searching, or a lifetime of building up his spiritual power to, you know, you can sense a little bit of regret <laughs> in terms of um, what a fool was I to turn away, but on the other hand, it's a celebration of really knowing the real answer, really knowing the true answer of, of turning it all over to God in not just wanting to, but having done it. And uh, he, he really uh, modeled this for everybody. He showed everyone what it was like to be on that path of finally finding God. And so it's there for all of us. And this music, he would go into bliss with each song. So it's been spiritualized. It has a self-realization element. So whatever song you learn that he's written, in addition to Master's Chants, we've got that spiritual power behind that music. I'm going to end with one more song. Um, it's not on there. It's called Life Mantra, or is it called Chant of the Angels? I think. He's, when he wrote it, um, he called it Chant of the Angels. And uh, then later on he changed it to Life Mantra. And the reason why it's called that is the words are very simple. God is life, life is God, life is joy. Anything else? Uh, God is life, God is God joy, life is, is God. Is there's, joy. A, there's also love in there, isn't there? God, God is life, God mm -hmm. is joy, life is God, life is joy. That's all it is. So. It's just over and over again. God is life. God is joy. And just over and over. But it, it's got uh, different musical parts weaving in and out of this song. And it's, it's a few minutes long. And so what I'm going to ask us to do is listen to it and met, try to meditate while we're listening to it and really feel that um, aspect to it. And when... when I remember once a group of us were had learned it already and we were performing it quite a bit in different places. After one rehearsal, I remember I could hear the song in my head for days. And not only that, it did not sound like how we had recorded it and how we had sung it. It sounded like angels singing it. And I felt that's why Swamiji must have called it Chant of the Angels, because in the astral world, there's different realms within that astral world, and there's supposedly something called sphere of music. So those who are attuned to music or something, I don't know the rules, really. <laughs> but, but there's a place where astral music is composed and done. And so it really felt like that sphere like Swami heard them singing it and then wrote it here and but there is a link so as we um, listen to that 
then we'll just meditate briefly to end things. We'll do a, we'll still have a, we'll still have an RT. Um, and, and just see if you can hear the angels sing. Don't, don't force it, but <laughs> e- even those who are singing are angels too, so. Life mantra, let's see. Okay, which one do I want?
Given our time constraint, I cut about five minutes off of that. <laughs> but uh, it was quite a, an amazing song to record. It's um, the there's a whole album of it where it alternates the 11 minute song with five minutes of instrumental, and it does that about four times. So you can it's a nice thing to have on in your house and just have it kind of cleansing the environment with God is life, God is joy, life is God, life is joy, just over and over and over again. It's a, it's a beautiful affirmation and uh, um, very powerful to listen to the whole 11 minutes.